Good to see you here this morning. We're glad for the presence of everyone. Any visitors who are here, we're glad for your presence also. We've been studying this quarter, uh, studying heaven, hell, and the end of time. And this last few weeks here, uh, we've already discussed hell and uh, heaven. We're going to talk about the end of time, uh, talking about some definitions that we're going to hopefully have a good understanding of when we get through, and some of the events that will happen that the Bible indicates to us will happen at the end of time, both spiritual events and, and physical events. As I say, we're going to look at some definitions. That's how we're going to begin this morning. Uh, and we'll, because some of the definitions that we find in the Bible may be a little different than what the world uh, takes. And we'll be using those definitions, if you will, in this study. Well, understanding that the world may have a different idea about some things. Before we begin, I'd like to have a word of prayer and ask Brother Lee Hatfield to do this, that prayer. If you would now, let's bow our heads and Lee will be leading us. Holy Father in heaven, we're indeed thankful for this day. Father, we're thankful that we can assemble here on this first day to assemble and study your word. Father, we're thankful for Jesus and for all he's done for each one of us. Father, you've blessed us many, many times. Father, we're thankful for our teachers. We're thankful for Doug here as he brings forth the message this morning. Father, we ask, we pray for those that are unable to be here, some by their own choosing. We pray that they will see the need to be here and study from your word. Father, we thank you at this time and we praise you. These things we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Before we begin, I need to make a, uh, uh, a little bit of an apology and a correction. Uh, two weeks ago when we uh, had the lesson, uh, the last lesson we had on heaven, I mentioned we were asking the question, will we recognize people in heaven? And I used an example, the transfiguration. And uh, I, was, I was going by memory, didn't have the names written down in my notes, so naturally I made a mistake. As I... My wife pointed out to me, I said that Moses and Abraham were there. And it wasn't Moses and Abraham, it was Moses and Elijah. So if you were there and uh, you heard that, maybe you caught it. Uh, Abraham wasn't at the transfiguration, it was Elijah instead. So I wanted to make that correction. Uh, I knew that and sometimes when you're up here, you, your memory slips a little bit. And I didn't have the names written down, I just had transfiguration. And, uh, so anyway, I apologize for that. Uh, the point was still valid, though. Peter recognized them, and so I, I believe we'll recognize each other in heaven. When we talk about the end of time, I want to get some definitions down before we begin uh, looking at Bible verses. <clears throat> uh, question we need to ask and make sure we understand, and from the standpoint of this study, is what is time? What is time? Now, I think uh, I won't have any disagreement with the secular definitions I get. I've got three of them here. Uh, one of them is, uh, they're very similar, uh, the indefinite continued progress of existence and events in the past, present, and future regarded as whole. Uh, another way to say that is, another dictionary says, the system of those sequential re relations that any event has to any other as pre past, present, or future, indefinite and continuous dur duration regarded as that in which events succeed one another. And a third one, again, very similar. Uh, the measured or measurable period of, time, period of time, period during which an action, process, or condition exists or continues, uh, a non-spatial continuum that is measured in terms of events which succeed one another from past through present and to future. Uh, and those are some di dictionary definitions of time. All three of those mention the words past, present, and future. And I think we understand what time is. Uh, now, in just a few minutes, we're going to talk about when did time begin. And I'm going to give you uh, the definition I'm using for purposes of this study. And it takes into consideration these, but uh, I believe for purposes of this study, I'm going to say there was a beginning of time. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Another word I want to, we're going to be talking about, we need to understand what it means, 
is eternity. Now here I've got, uh, again, I've got three dictionary definitions. One is uh, infinite or unending time. Uh, second one, very similar, infinite time or duration without beginning or end. Uh, and in that same dictionary it says uh, eternal existence, especially as contrasted with mortal life. <clears throat> A third dictionary says, again, very similar, time without an end, uh, a state that comes after death and never ends, or time that seems to be without an end. Now, I'm going to differ a little bit from these dictionary definitions for purposes of this study because I'm going to ask the question in this study, when is the end of time? And we're going to talk about that. And I'm going to uh, assume and from what I read in the Bible and somewhat from personal uh, opinion, I guess, that there is a beginning and end of time. It is not eternity. They are differing things. Um, whereas uh, one dictionary said eternity was infinite or unending time. I'm going to take the, uh, I guess, the side of things or the opinion that time ends but eternity goes on. And there was a beginning of time and there will be an end of time. We'll say we'll discuss that in more detail and we'll go in, well, either today or next week, probably today. Another word that uh, you won't find in the Bible, and maybe you've never heard of it, is a term called eschatology. Now that's a, a Greek word, you know, all those Greek words end with uh, O-G-Y or study of something. You know, biology uh, is a study of living things. Uh, but eschatology is uh, a study of something, and again, I've got some di dictionary definitions. Uh, one dictionary says, the part of theology concerning with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and humankind. Uh, second dictionary says, any system of doctrines concerning last or final matters as death, judgment, and the future state, etc. And a third dictionary says, uh, it's got a couple definitions there, a branch of theology concerned with the final events in the history of the world and or of humankind and a belief concerning death, the end of the world, or the ultimate destiny of humankind. Now I say eschatology is a word not found in the Bible, but it is a study of those things that will happen at the end of time or at the end of humankind. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So if you ever uh, pick up a book or an article and it's about eschatology, that's what it's talking about. The things that will happen at the end of the world. And we're going to be looking at what the Bible says about those things. So we're going to be looking at eschatology. Uh, one more definition. And this is a definition that the world has that the Bible has more than one understanding of. What is death? Now, I think most of us have a very clear understanding of what physical death is. And that's the world's definition of death. And it is accurate up to a point, we'll say. Uh, one definition of death is the end of life of a person or an organism. That being any, uh, a plant can die, a person can die, an animal can die, you know. Another dictionary says the act of dying or the end of life, the total and permanent cessation of all the vital functions of an organism. The final cessation of all the vital functions of an organism. We have a term that's used in, in medicine today. It's a, uh, a couple terms. One's clinical death, one's uh, someone is brain dead. And while those, uh, if someone is brain dead, their portions of their body are still functioning, but there's no evidence that there's any brain activity. So it's not the total physical death, but we understand those terms, we've heard those terms. And when all functions of the body or the organs cease to function, uh, that is when the body dies, and that is death. Uh, another dictionary says much the same thing, a permanent cessation of all vital functions, the end of life. And these are describing physical death. 
And the Bible talks about physical death, and it is real, and those definitions are accurate. But the Bible talks about more than physical death. It talks about a spiritual death. And it also talks about a second death. And we're looking at all three of these, in particular the spiritual death and the second death, because they have something to do with the end of our lives on this earth and the end of the earth itself, the end of the world. So uh, I don't know that you'll read. I, I didn't find. I only looked at three dictionaries. I didn't find any any mention of a spiritual death or a second death. But there are definitely uh, terms or, or phrases and understandings that we get from the Bible. So we're going to be talking about physical death and spiritual death, and a second death. I want to look at uh, definition you you can find in Vines. Uh, Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words for Death. And it's got a long, long paragraph on it. I'm just going to uh, touch on some of it. Uh, it's from the Greek word uh, thanant thanantos. And in Scripture, it's often used to indicate the separation of the soul from the body. The soul being the spiritual part of man. We've talked about the use of the term soul and spirit. Uh, but when the soul or when the spirit separates in the body, uh, this is death. And that term is used in the Bible, and the word term death is used in the Bible to represent that. And uh, this is uh, a, the physical death, when the soul leaves the body, when the spirit leaves the body and the body goes back to the earth. We'll look at some verses in just a few minutes. A second definition there in Vine says the separation of man from God. This is a spiritual death. It's not a physical death. It's a spiritual death. Separation of man from God. When Adam and Eve uh, were in the Garden of Eden and they ate of the tree, they were told if they ate of that tree, uh, they would die. And they did they would eventually die physically, but on that day they died physically, uh, spiritually. They had sinned and they had separated themselves from God. And that separation was emphasized to them in that they were evicted from the garden. Uh, they were told on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And Satan said, no, you won't die. Well, they did not die physically that day, but spiritually they did. And as we look at some verses in the Bible and passages, Hopefully we'll understand why that event caused them to be spiritually dead. They separated themselves from God. Uh, another sentence here in, in Vine's expository uh, dictionary says something that I think we need to understand. In the Bible, death is the opposite of life. It does not denote non-existence. Uh, a, a spiritual life is conscious existence in communion with God. Spiritual death is conscious existence in separation from God. I want to make sure we understood that. It, first, it doesn't denote non-existence. There are people in the world today, um, and uh, many people, as a matter of fact, believe when you die physically, you cease to exist totally. That's the end of everything that is you. Now, that's true for animals, but man has a spirit. And that's not the end of man's existence. His physical body ceases to exist, it ceases to function, but that's not the end of his existence. There are people in the world today that believe that when you die, if you've been a sinful person, if you've been an unrighteous person, you will suffer some punishment in hell. But that that punishment is only a temporary thing and that after you served your time in hell that's a, a phrase I'll use that your spirit or your soul ceases to exist you're not allowed to go to heaven but you cease to exist therefore the punishment of hell is not eternal now, others believe that you'll spend a certain period of time in, in hell or purgatory as the Catholic Church calls it and after a period of time when you served enough time there, served your penance, you'll be allowed to go to heaven. 
So that belief is that you continue to exist, but your, only, your punishment is only a temporary thing, and ultimately you spend eternity in heaven. Others believe you won't get to heaven, as I say, but you will cease to exist totally. Now, both these beliefs are not found in the Bible. Uh, we're going to look at some passages in the coming lessons that indicate to us that, you know, hell is eternal. It's, it's going to last forever. Uh, it doesn't go away. You don't cease to exist. And we, when we looked at hell, we talked about how it's described and how uh, it, uh, it will feel. You know, the words torment, terms lake of fire, uh, fire and brimstone come to mind. Hell is not going to be a pleasant place. And it will be a permanent separation from God. The separation from God is a spiritual death. Uh, we'll look at some verses in, in just a short time indicate to us that you can be physically alive and spiritually dead. And I said the world doesn't talk much about that, uh, but the Bible does mention it. I want to look at some examples in the Bible that uh, talk about death. We're going to look at several as a matter of fact. We need to understand that uh, what physical death is, of course, and the Bible does speak to that. In James, uh, well, James 2.26 says, just as the, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith that it works is dead. Now, he's talking about faith there, but he uses the example, the body without the spirit is dead. And that tells us when the spirit, when our spirit, when our soul leaves the body, the body is dead. It's over with. It's, it does cease to exist. It will go back to the dust from which it came. Uh, Matthew 27, 50. This is an account of the crucifixion. And we read there, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. At that point in time, Jesus died physically. He yielded up his spirit. His spirit left his body and his body ceased to function. And of course, later on it was buried, and uh, in Jesus' example, the body came back to life. He was resurrected. Uh, but we won't do that. We'll be resurrected, and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks. We will be resurrected, but it won't be in the same way that Jesus was. Well, maybe in the same way, I'll say, but it won't be for the same purpose. Uh, but Jesus died on the cross when his spirit left his body. Uh, another verse from the gospel accounts of the crucifixion, Luke 23, 46. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Again, a verse indicating to us when the spirit left Jesus' body, he died. He breathed his last. His body ceased to function. And one more in John 19. When Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So all three of these verses show us uh, an example of Jesus on the cross. When he died, his spirit left his body, and his body died. That was the end of it. He, he breathed his last. Uh, one more example of someone physically dying. This is in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen uh, was being stoned. Right before he died, uh, we read in Acts 59, Acts 7, verse 59. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against him. And having said this, he fell asleep. He knew he was about to die, and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And, and then he fell asleep. Now, the term fell asleep, or asleep in the Bible, uh, sometimes denotes physical death uh, but in this case uh, it was Stephen and he mentions that his spirit is about to leave his body and then right immediately after that he fell asleep he died so that's physical death and physical death is mentioned in the Bible many many times uh, we read about the genealogies in the Old Testament and it says someone lived so many years and he died uh, you may, he had offspring, etc., and but they died. Uh, 
A physical death is something, unfortunately, we all understand because we've all experienced uh, loved ones dying or friends dying. We hear about it every day on the news. Uh, it's, it's with us. It's, it's part of life, if you will, the end of our physical life. So I think everybody understands physical death. But as I said, the Bible talks about spiritual death. I mentioned Genesis already. I want to read the verse in Genesis 2.17 where the command was given to Adam and Eve, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. And when they did eat from that, they sinned and they were separated from God, and spiritual death, they became spiritually dead at that point in time. They were, sin had separated them from God. They, eventually they would die physically, uh, but that day they sinned and they were spiritually dead. And as I said in Genesis 3.23, that was emphasized to them when they were sent in the garden. We read that verse, Therefore the Lord God sent them out of the garden of Eden, or garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So their punishment was a separation from God and it was emphasized to them in that they had to leave the garden of Eden, which was uh, probably as close to heaven on earth as anybody could ever come uh, or anything could ever come but they were forced to leave that and they were separated from God and spiritually dead in Isaiah 59 2 this is a verse we often use in teaching people but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you your iniquities have made a separation between you and God your sins will separate you from God uh, and you will be spiritually dead. Now, fortunately, there is a way to come back to God and be reconciled to God. That's become a, and, and today it's to become a Christian. Uh, go through those steps that we, the New Testament talks about to help us to believe and to repent and confess and to be baptized and be reconciled to God. But when we sin... We are separated from God. Isaiah 59 2 says that in no uncertain terms. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. And in Romans 5 12, there's emphasis that this sin entered in the world through Adam. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death entered the world also when Adam sinned. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Other passages of Romans indicate to us that all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. We all sin from time to time. And unless we uh, repent and change our ways and live a faithful life, we will remain uh, spiritually dead to God throughout our lives and throughout eternity. I say, fortunately, we can be reconciled to God. And God makes provision for forgiveness from sin so that we can be reconciled to God. That's not the thrust of this study, but uh, it's important to understand. We all sin, we all separate ourselves from God, but we can come back to God. And the Bible tells us exactly how we can do that. We need to understand in the Bible, uh, it talks about the second death. And the second death is a spiritual death that never, ever ends. Uh, a few passages that mention that. 2 Thessalonians 1, 19, 1, 9. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Eternal destruction. Uh, separated from God for eternity. This is one of those verses that tells us that our punishment in hell isn't just a temporary thing. It's not going to be last for a while and then we'll be uh, allowed to go to heaven or it's not going to last for just a while and then we cease to exist. Uh, uh, the people that believe in that, it's, it, it's called uh, annihilation. Uh, and your, your spirit is annihilated, you cease to exist, so you, you don't feel any more pain, you don't feel the punishment of hell. The Bible here in this verse says it's going to be eternal destruction and it will never, ever end. Revelations 20, verse 14 says, And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. 
the second death that we refer, the Bible refers to. It is a spiritual death, it's separation from God, but it, again, it's one that will never ever end. Another passage in Revelation verse, chapter 21, verse 8, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I describe several kinds of people there, the coward, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. All will suffer the eternity in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, and that is the second death. So the Bible refers to three deaths, if you will. A physical death, a spiritual death, and a second death. A spiritual death, and they're all, they all involve separation. Physical death is a separation of your spirit from your body. Spiritual death is a separation from uh, God. And the second death is a separation from God that goes on for eternity. Uh, it is spiritual death that never ends. Now, fortunately, as I said, spiritual death on earth can be ended. We have that option. We have that choice. And I want to look at some passages that indicate to us that we can be spiritually dead while we're here but not, spirit, uh, not physically dead. Uh, recall the passages in Genesis uh, when Adam and Eve were told, if you eat from that, you'll surely die that day, and they, then they were kicked out of the garden. Uh, they did not cease to live physically. They lived a great many years beyond that. Uh, they had three sons that we know of that are named Cain, Abel, and Seth, and it says they had other children after that. Uh, Adam lived to be, I believe, 930 years old. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it was 930. He lived a great many years after he was banished from the garden. But he, he, when he left the garden, he was spiritually dead and separated from God. Uh, but spiritually dead, but not physically dead. In Isaiah 59, 2, a verse we already read, your iniquities make a separation between you and God. When we sin, when you and I sin, or when anybody sins, uh, that can lead to our physical death. You know, it may be something that we're doing that ultimately causes us to die physically, but not necessarily and not usually the case. When we sin, we continue to live physically. In Luke 15, 32, read, but we had to be merry and rejoice this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. This is the story of the prodigal son. Uh, if you recall, the young son wanted his inheritance. He got it. He went away to a foreign country. He spent all his money, wasted it away. And then finally, when he was sitting by the pigs and feeding the pigs, he was so hungry he was eating what the pigs ate. Now, to, you think about this to a Jew, this is the bottom. Of, this is the bottom. <laughs> you know, uh, pigs were unclean animals. They didn't eat pigs. And now this, this young man is eating the food the pigs are eating. So he's, he's at the bottom of his uh, uh, emotional life, if you will. And he realized that he, he's better off as a servant in his father's house than he is there. So he goes back home. And when the, he comes back, you know, the father sees him, runs to meet him, uh, throws a feast, and the older brother is not happy. And the father tells him, your younger brother was dead and is now alive. He was, now in that story, the father represents God. The younger son was separated from God, uh, and he was dead. But he's come back, and the father welcomed him back. And now he, he says, "What his brother of yours was dead, but now has begun to live. Uh, many lessons from that story. But one of them is that even though we are separated from our Father, we can come back to the Father and become spiritually alive again. In Ephesians 2, chapter 1, I think this is about as plain as you can get. This is Paul writing to the Christians at Ephesus. And he tells them, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, they are now Christians. They've been saved. But Paul tells them, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Obviously, they weren't physically dead, but they were spiritually dead. 
And Paul says, he says that in no uncertain terms. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. They were spiritually dead, but physically alive. Uh, one more, a couple more passages. Colossians 2.13 read, And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our transgressions. When you were dead, they were dead in their transgressions and, and the uncircumcision of their flesh, God made them alive with him, having forgiven us of all our transgressions. God made allowances for us to be forgiven, a way for us to be forgiven, and even though we were spiritually dead or are spiritually dead, we can become spiritually alive again, just like that younger son, the prodigal son that went away and came back to the father. 1 Timothy 5, 6, again, this is one that uh, is pretty plain to understand. It says, but she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Now, if you don't have any understanding of spiritual death, if you read that verse, you say, that doesn't make any sense. How can you be dead while you're alive? But it is talking about being spiritually dead and being physically alive. And all of us in, in here, at some point in time in our lives, we're spiritually dead and still physically alive. But we take those steps that are outlined in the New Testament, we do those things, and we can come back, just like that prodigal son did, and become alive again. We can be reconciled to God. But the point of this lesson, I want to make sure we understand that we can be spiritually dead, but not physically dead. Uh, and many people live their entire lives in spiritual death, and finally they're physically dead. And if they haven't done anything about it, then that spiritual death will become a second death. The second death the Bible talks about, and they will be separated from God eternally. I want to make emphasis to something that we all understand, I think, very well. Physical death is a certainty. Uh, in coming lessons, we're going to talk about the end of time. We will all die physically. Either we will die physically before the end of time comes, or we'll die physically when the end of time comes. I want to talk about in a few minutes when... When, when is that? But uh, whenever it is, we're all going to face physical death. We're all going to go through it. Either before the end of time, before the world ends, or when the world ends. Uh, I don't know when that's going to be. You say, well, look at some verses and passages about that. But we're all going to face that. It's a certainty. Some passages that emphasize to this, that very fact. Ecclesiastes 3.20. All go to the same place. All came from the dust, and all returned to the dust. Referring to when God formed man, he formed him the dust of the earth, breathed in the breath of life. But here the ecclesiastical writer Solomon says, we're all going back to the dust. No exceptions, our physical bodies will cease, and they'll go back to the dust from whence they came. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9.5, For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything nor have they longer any longer, nor have have they lo any longer a reward for their memories forgotten. The living know they will die. We all need to understand that. I think we all do, but we, sometimes it's hard to face. We're all going to die. Uh, we don't know when that's going to be. You know, sometimes when things happen, we have an accident, we get a disease, uh, or we're faced with a situation. Uh, when we know that death is probably going to come, or maybe death is certainly going to come. But right here, right now, uh, we can't point out uh, individually, we can't say, I'm going to die at this second on this day uh, in the future. We don't know. We don't know that. It's, but we do know that that time is coming. That day will come when we will die. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. It's dust it's referring to there is the physical body. It's going to return to the earth where it came from, but the spirit will return to God who gave it. So every one of us has a physical 
existence. Every one of us has a spiritual existence. And when we die, those two will be separated from each other. That's the separation that physical death is. The physical body will decay, deteriorate, go back to the dust. But the spirit goes back to God. So we don't cease to exist. Our bodies do, our physical bodies, but not uh, our spirit. It goes back to God. We need to, I think most of us understand, but we need to understand also that sometimes uh, physical death comes, well, maybe all the time, it seems to come sooner than we want it to. Uh, many passages in the Bible refer to that. I want to look at just one or two. 1 Peter 1.24 Read, all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass wither and the flower falls off. Uh, every summer here in Texas, every spring, grass comes out. Even when it had rained much, the grass comes out and it's nice and green. Now, sometimes by the 1st of June, it may be already brown. Sometimes it stays green most of the summer. But when summer's over, when fall comes and winter comes and First frost comes, the grass dies. Uh, the top of it does. The leaves die. They turn brown. Uh, they cease growing. Now they have roots that are still alive, but the grass is gone for that year. Uh, it won't grow anymore until the next spring. And we understand that. It's a certainty. We know that. Uh, we've, we've all seen that many times in our lives. So just like our physical death is a certainty or like that grass dying in the winter or in the fall when the first frost comes is a certainty our physical deaths are a certainty and a verse we hear often Hebrews 9 27 inasmuch as it's appointed for men once to die and after that comes judgment so we're all going to die but that's not the end of our existence it's not the end of our spirit something's going to happen after that uh, Hebrews 9 27 tells us one of those things is going to happen, judgment. Now, we're going to look at some passages in the coming lessons that talk about when judgment's going to happen, what some things about judgment. We probably have already have a pretty good idea. But judgment will come. Now, judgment, the judgment day is not necessarily when we die. As I indicated, we're all going to die physically one day. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, but it may not be at the end of the world. And when we die, our spirit is separated from our bodies. Our spirit goes back to God and will go to uh, the Hadean realm, to one of two areas, one of two places, if you will. Uh, one's described as torment, one's described as paradise. Now, depending on which one uh, someone's spirit is in, they know where they're going to spend eternity. But that is not the judgment day. The judgment day will come later. And we're going to be talking about that in, in the next two or three weeks. There will be a judgment. It will be, I've described it as a final sentencing. Uh, the verdict is in in certain respects when you physically die. Uh, but day, the judgment won't come, the day of judgment won't come until later. Unless we happen to live until the end of the world comes. Because that's when the judgment will come. I said, well, look at some verses that tell us that. There are many, as I mentioned, there are many passages that talk in the Bible that tell us we don't know how long we're going to live. First Chronicles 29, 15 says, For we are sojourners before thee, and tenants as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow. There is no hope. You know, uh, I have a home, and if we go on a trip or something, I come back home, and I think uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to understand that home is not a permanent home. Now, I may last for several years. I, I've lived in Garland since what, 1977, so I've lived here a, a long time, but this is not a permanent home. I need to understand that I'm just a sojourner and a tenant here on this earth. And I won't be here forever. I'm just here for a little while. Now, 1977, that's uh, why well, I'm getting about 
50 years almost, something like that. Uh, been here a good while, but looking back on it, it went by pretty fast. And I think everybody in here, if you look back on your life, you could probably say it went by faster than I wanted it to go by. Uh, time uh, is the same for everyone, but time seems to go by ever faster and faster. Years ago, my father-in-law told me when uh, that time just seemed to keep speeding up. I was very young then. We'd just been married a little while, and I had time, and, time enough to do everything. But now I look back, and yeah, time just keeps speeding up. And we all need to understand that it's the way we all feel at some, at some point in our life. And we look back, and we think about, boy, the time I could have spent doing this or that, the time I've wasted uh, problem is, we sometimes keep on wasting some time, and I do that too. But time goes on faster. When we go home, it's not our permanent home. We need to look on it as we're just tenants here for a while, and the home we really want will be a permanent one. That's the one we need to try for. In Job 7, 6, we read, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to an end without hope. As I say, the older you get, the more you can understand, yeah, your days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. They seem to have gone by so, so fast. I uh, look at my children, and they've got children, and, you know, I'm not supposed to be that old that, uh, you know, I've got grandchildren that are, you know, as old as they are. That's, um, that's not right. I, look, I say that in one sense because it, it was only yesterday I was getting out of high school. Uh, I can remember it very well. Uh, I can remember being a child. I can remember being very young. Uh, I'm not so very young anymore, and it went by very quickly. Our days are like a weaver's shuttle. Job in Job 9 and 25 says, Now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. And indeed, we all, as we get older, you understand that. They just go by so fast. They flee away. Uh, Psalms 103, verse, starting in verse 15, as, a man, as for a man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes when the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. You know, every, almost every spring here in Texas, you can go out and look at the blue bonnets in April. But what, what about in July? How many blue bonnets you see out on the side of the road? No more blue flowers, they're gone. They're here for a brief time, and then they're gone. And that's how our lives are. Uh, briefly, and then it's gone. Uh, Isaiah 47 Similar thought, the grass withers, the fire fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass, and surely people are like grass. We're all like that. We're here for a while, and the wind comes, and we wither away. And probably the uh, most off-quoted verse about the brief brevity of life, James 4.14, Yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, from one standpoint, that's a very sad verse. <laughs> We're just here for a little while and then we vanish away. But it is true. If we live to be 70 years old or maybe even older or maybe even 100 years old, people, some people still live to be 100, some people a little beyond that, how long is that when you look at, let's say, the history of the world? How long is 100 years? It goes by pretty quick. You know, if you study history, you, you can study, you know, how long does an empire last or a country last. They may last several centuries. Uh, Rome lasts several centuries, but it came to an end. But one man's life is very short in comparison to uh, the world's life. It's only here for a little while. It's like a vapor and it vanishes away. Now, even though it's a sad thought, we need to realize we have time to do things. And what we need to do, as another patch tells us, redeem that time and use it properly and use it to the best of our abilities. And we can do many things in the time that we're here. Uh, any of us that raise children, when they grow up and leave the home and go out on their own, do we look back on, that, on the time they were home and say, you know, I wish I'd have done this, or maybe I should have done this or said this? I think all of us would say that to some extent, some of us to a large extent, some to a smaller. But we all think of things we could have done and should have done. 
but we didn't. And just like anybody else, you know, when we, when we compare that, I, I tell people, you need to raise your children very properly as best you can because you only get one opportunity to raise one child. You don't get a second chance to raise a child. You get one chance, and you need to do the best you can. Well, you know what? We only get one chance to live our lives, one opportunity to live our lives. Now, we may live to be 100 years old, but we still only have one life. We need to use it to the best of our ability. I want to mention some things to ponder in the next few minutes, some things to think about. Physical death is the end of our abilities on earth. Once we die physically, all the things we were able to do or wanted to be able to do, we won't be able to do anymore. That opportunity is gone. That chance to use our abilities is gone. Physical death is the end of our opportunities on earth. Whatever we could have done or what we thought we could have done, we won't be able to do it anymore. Not on earth. You know, the rich man, when he was in torment, he wanted to do something. He wanted to uh, warn his brothers to change their lives so they wouldn't join him in torment. But that opportunity was gone. It never came to him. His life had ended and that opportunity ceased to exist. We need to certainly understand that physical death is not the end of our existence. Uh, and as I mentioned, many, there are people in the world that believe that it is, that we're no better than animals. But man has a spirit. We don't cease to exist when we physically die. Our spirit continues to exist, and it will continue to exist eternally. The Bible teaches us that. Where it continues to exist, we have a say. But we have to use the opportunities while we're physically alive to make sure we end up where we want to end up for eternity, where our spirit will end up eternity. Physical death does not necessarily mean one is wicked or that one is righteous. Uh, the wicked die and the righteous die. We understand that. The Bible's full of that uh, example after example of the wicked dying and the righteous dying. And uh, just because we die doesn't mean that we were bad. It doesn't mean that we were good. Physical death does not mean that God does not love man. God wants all of us to spend eternity in heaven. He make, made provisions for that. Uh, but we all die. Our, our physical bodies cease to exist or cease, and cease to function. But God uh, loves every man. And he's not willing that any should perish. He wants everyone to be saved. So just because we die physically doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. God loves everyone. He wants everyone to be saved. And a uh, final thought for us to think about, physical death can be viewed as a doorway to eternity. Uh, I don't, you don't find that phrase in the Bible. This, this is Doug's phrase. Physical death is a doorway to eternity. After we die, uh, our eternal destiny is, is determined. And we'll be told that in the day of judgment. It'll be shown to us in no uncertain terms. But we need to look on death as a doorway to eternity but we have the opportunity to decide what that doorway leads to while we're here. Uh, there's only two destinations for our spirit, two final destinations, eternal destinations. While we're here physically, we can determine that destination. Each of us individually. We can influence others, hopefully we will. Uh, we can urge others, and hopefully we will. We can teach others, we can point them in the right direction, but every man is responsible for his own actions. We're going to talk about the Day of Judgment in the coming lessons and that every man will be judged according to his actions. Whatever you do, I won't be judged according to what you do. I'll be judged according to what I do. Whatever my children do, they'll be judged according to that. Now, I'll face... Uh, judgment for the actions I took while I was raising them, but for the actions they take after they're grown, they are responsible for. Every person is individually responsible. So while we're here on this earth, we need to make sure we take opportunities that we can while we have them 
so that when that doorway opens into eternity, and that doorway will open on the day of judgment, we will go in the pla to the place we want to go. So I say the world has definitions of death. The Bible has some additional ones. We need to be aware of what they are and take advantage of the opportunities we have while we are physically alive so that we won't face spiritual death and that second death. Uh, next week, we'll talk about when does time end, when does it end, and then get into some of the events that are happening at the end of time. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you in the end.